as we, as Paul brings his closing statements in this amazing epistle, I kind of feel like I'm giving, saying goodbye to a good friend. Last week I was a little stressed out because we had a business meeting and the time was catching chapter 4, verse 7 to 18, and we come uh, to a section uh, that's very common in Paul's letters. He, in most of his epistles, he takes time at the end to mention some people's names. And as I said last week, Paul, we've learned that Paul was not only a soul winner, he was a great friend maker. I looked into some of the names that Paul mentioned in his epistles and uh, someone took the time to count the name, the number. And uh, this individual, this commentary said, it is my estimate that there are more than 100 different Christian associates named and unnamed with Paul in the book of Acts and in the other epistles. 100 names. Would you be able to remember? of 100 names of people that maybe you've met in different churches? I would have a problem. But Paul doesn't seem to, and he not only just mentions their name, he mentions qualities, different areas of ministry that they did, that they did while he was with them. And here in this uh, last, uh, in this epistle, Colossians, um, he said per personal greetings from six of his associates in ministry. He mentions Aristarchus. I already gave you some information on him last week. We'll go through that briefly. Then in the individual who most people think, you know, what was probably a failure. Uh, after looking into this man called John Mark, I realized that he wasn't a failure. Maybe at one point he was. But he picked up straight away and did a tremendous work. And today we have his, the gospel with his name in the Bible. He also mentions the name of a man called Jesus, Je Jesus, or Justus. All these men were Jews. And then he mentions three who were Gentiles, Epaphras, Luke, the physician, and Demas. He closes with a very good, a positive note here about Demas, but we will learn hopefully maybe next week, maybe we get uh, there today, that Demas was one of those men that betrayed him. So we have Three different groups of people mentioned here, the men who stayed, who made the difference in his ministry. The men who prayed, you should know the name of that person by now, are being sharing a lot of things about Epaphras, and Epaphras for me stands out as a hero, a hero of the faith. But then we will come to this man called Demas, and we will learn that at the end of the, his, uh, at a stage in his life, he, he strayed, he, he turned his back on the Apostle Paul. So let's, let's have a word of prayer and ask the Lord Jesus to help us as we try to go through these names. Now, again, don't, don't fall asleep on me. You know, when we, when we go through a list of names, it's very easy to go, Come on, give me something interesting to think about. But I, as I, if, if we look at these names, it'll, there's a message behind each one of these individuals. And I think they have something to teach us this afternoon. Are we the kind of individual, the kind of believer that stays when tough moments come? Or are we those who simply turn their back when difficult times come and leave uh, abandoned the work that God has called us to do? Are we the, the kind that agonize, as Epaphras is presented here, agonize in prayer for others? He's the kind of man that you probably wouldn't see, um, you know, uh, doing very much with Paul, but Paul mentions him and he says, and he commends him because his prayers were tremendously powerful. Uh, Epaphras had the, the privilege of praying with Paul. That was a great privilege. And Paul heard him pray, and he said, wow, just his prayers encouraged me. Then we'll see the men who strayed. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we want to do justice to each one of these individuals, but we also want to learn a lesson. This is not just writing on paper. 
you have preserved this for over 2,000 years just for this night, for us this afternoon to learn something from. And I pray that as we close this chapter, it'll still be a, one more message to go, but as we look at these closing sentences, that we will look, we will see why Paul um, took the time to mention these names. And I pray, Lord, that you will teach me uh, how to be one of those men who stay and pray and not one of those who flee, who fade away, Lord, when things get rough. I pray, Lord, you will teach us a lesson here, something that will catch on, Lord, and make us maybe more aware of what we're here for. May your spirit, Lord, work in each heart. In Jesus' name, amen. But now you should know something about this name, Aristarchus. You know, the name of Aristarchus kind of comes at the end of the credits. If you look into uh, uh, a movie, you will see the first ones coming onto the screen, you know, the, the, the big shots, the, the movie stars. Well, Aristarchus' name would probably start rolling in, this, in, the, in the credits, probably at the end, but not because he's of less importance. So we find some things about Aristarchus, and there in chapter 4, verse 10, we see, first of all, that he was a fellow prisoner, and also one who, uh, uh, by, by volunteering, he didn't, wasn't there in prison with Paul because he was arrested with Paul, but because he wanted to be there with him uh, to encourage him. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, he says he's a fellow prisoner. In Colossians 4, verse, chapter 4, verse 11, he says he's a fellow worker who comforted me. He's there. He's been encouraging me. You know, in every church you need encouragers, don't you think? We need, uh, we need Barnabases, if you allow me that, to say it that way. We need men like, and women like Aristarchus who, you know, when things get rough, they stick with it. They're there to say, hey, you're not alone in this. We're studying this morning about uh, uh, Elijah, how he said, Lord, I'm all, I'm all by myself. I'm all alone. He said, I have reserved me 7,000 witnesses. We're not alone in this. We're, we're in this together. This is where, this is the title of the message. We've learned also that Aristarchus was from Macedonia, and he was a travel companion of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 19 gives us this information. Originally from Thessalonica, Chapter 20, verse 4 of the book of Acts. And we also learn about Aristarchus because he, as Paul says, that he risked his neck in Paul's favor. Remember the Ephesian riot? I enjoyed that section because, as I said, as I said last week, when we went to uh, Turkey, we got to go to the city of Ephesus. As you go from the top bottom, you find a, a small theater uh, where sometimes businesses was conducted. And later on, you find a big, enormous theater. And I think it was there where this riot took place. And it was Aristarchus who said, Hey, Paul, in my own words, you're worth more alive than dead. You, you go. You take, you, we'll take care of things here. But then we see that he wasn't only there for the, uh, to, you know, during the riot. He was with Paul uh, on, on a long journey, on a long voyage to Rome. He was with Paul when that big storm took place. And here we see that uh, um, um, Aristarchus is with Paul in prison. A fellow prisoner, as he says there in chapter 4, verse 10. Fellow prisoner probably means that Aristarchus shared Paul's confinement with him so that he could be helped and comforted to, uh, as an apostle. He was a volunteer prisoner. Let me ask you a question that is kind of a humorous, but maybe not. If I was arrested for preaching the gospel, would you come and visit me at, at, at prison? Would you come and stay with me? Probably not. <laughs> I need encouragement. Anybody volunteer to stay with me a couple of weeks? You know, if you ask uh, Aristarchus, he said, Paul, Paul, count on me. I'm, I'm, I will, I'll, be, I'll be with you. Very special individual, Aristarchus. And I hope after we 
We've learned this. We, we, the next time you hear the word Aristarchus, oh, he's one of the heroes. He's one of the, he's one of the, the guys that stuck with it when things got really difficult. For me, as I said, if I had a, a wall of uh, fame or a wall of faith uh, here to name individuals that inspire me, I would put Aristarchus there in the list. And then we, we went through John Mark. John Mark, if you, as you know, uh, was with Jesus Christ during the three years of ministry. And uh, he's mentioned several times. He's uh, in, chapter, in chapter 4, verse 10, it says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salute you. And Mark, and kind of describes who this Mark is, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. He will bring some, some orders to, uh, with him. If he come unto you, receive him, says Paul. Paul has got his trust on Mark. But as, as you know, uh, on, his, on Paul's and Barnabas' first missionary journey, typical of Barnabas, he said, Paul, how about if we take my cousin with me? How about if we take John Mark? It's going to be tough, Barnabas. We're going through un to uncharted territory. Uh, there will pro probably be persecution. We'll probably be whipped. We'll probably be put in prison. I wonder if Mark is going to hold on. I'm sure that com maybe that conversation went on. But it was, so Paul conceded and said, okay, let's take him with us. And you know what the Bible says when he went, when they entered the difficult territory, Mark became very discouraged and he, I don't know if he kind of caught uh, Barnabas in a corner and said, Barnabas, uh, you know, I think this was a mistake. I, I, I don't want to be here. I, uh, this is not what I expected. I don't know if he had that conversation with Barnabas, but he got discouraged. And we see that he turned his back on the, on, on the team. In, in Acts chapter 13, 5 and 13, it says, And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John, John Mark, to their minister. They, they, John was helping them, was ministering, was serving them. Now, when Paul and his company loosed from, Prow, uh, from Paphos, they came to Bega in Pamphylia. And what happens in Pamphylia? Things got really difficult, and uh, John Marks departed from them returning to Jerusalem. Not good. That could have discouraged the team, and they, would, could, they could have said, okay, guys, if he's leaving, uh, we better go also. Now, we don't know why he was discouraged, why he turned his back. Now, some commentators say that maybe he was afraid uh, because of the dangers that they were facing. Maybe he resented the fact that Paul was taking over the leadership when at the beginning it was Barnabas and Paul. Now it's Paul and Barnabas. You see the change in the book of Acts. Or maybe he resented Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. I don't want to be serving Gentiles. You know, we don't really know. We don't know the reason. We don't know why he turned back, but he did. And if you remember... Once they finished that journey, they, Paul and Barnabas came back with good tithings, good, a, good, a good report. Tremendous things the Lord did in that first missionary trip. And they go to the church, and I can just imagine John Mark in the corner there going like, uh, I could be part of that blessing, but I wasn't. And we find that after the report, um, typical of Barnabas, hey, Paul. How about taking uh, John Mark with us this time? Not going to happen. Come on, John. I mean, come on, Paul. Give me a second chance. Hey, this is not a bad second chance. We're going into hostile territory, and we don't need, and you know, he needs to understand, whoever comes needs to understand that this is not a Boy Scout trip, a field trip. This is going to be, tough. I don't know. Again, I'm filling in with my own ideas, but notice what happened when John Mark said, hey, Paul, I mean, sorry, when Barnabas said, hey, Paul, let's take Mark with us. In Acts chapter 15, verse 36 through 41, he says, and some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where he had preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas 
determined to take with him John, whose surname is Mark. But Paul, notice what happened here. Now, how many of you believe that Paul was a tremendous spiritual person? But how many of you would think that Paul had a really fervent argument with Barnabas? I cannot imagine two great spiritual men arguing this way, but it says this, but through, but though, but Paul thought not good to take him with him and departed from them to Pamphylia and went not with them to, uh, to work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from each other. So you hear this great contention with this uh, fervent discussion or argument. I'm not going, he's not coming with us. Paul, come on, don't be like that. Give him a chance. I gave you a chance. Remember, when nobody wanted to see you, uh, you know, I, I, I went out and reached for you and I brought you into the fellowship. And, you know, it was very hard for me. I risked a lot in, in that, in that decision. you know, you can go and, and Paul saying, I know what you did and I appreciate everything you did, Barnabas, but this is no way, not good, as the Bible says. Not good. This is not a good idea. If you want to take Barn uh, John Mark with you, I'm not going. I'm sorry. I'm sure Paul had his good reasons. But he thought, I, I imagine he, he would think that, you know, uh, if, if we do this again, we, we're going to make sure that we have the right men involved. And uh, this is not going to be a Boy Scout field trip. This is not going to be, this is going to be spiritual war. This is not sightseeing, as some would probably think in the mission field is, or doing some shopping for souvenirs so we can bring them back home. No, this is not it. This is going to be, we're going into hostile territory. It's going to be a spiritual war. We don't need individuals who kind of think about it and then say, excuse me, I'm going back home. We don't need that. Now, if you leave the story there, you would say, wow, I would never really want to be a John Mark. But you know, John Mark was an overcomer. He didn't stay discouraged. And Barnabas was a tool to get him back on his feet and go back to the mission field. He didn't stay back just behind, just going, <laughs> you know, my chance is gone. It'll never, it'll never come back. There's no more, nothing else for me there. No, John Mark got over that, over that and he got back on, on his feet and he went back with Barnabas to the ministry to, to the, and, and, and did, uh, and did uh, tremendous work to the point that later on Paul says, oh, bring John Mark with you because he is useful to me in the ministry. Another good thing about Paul, he didn't hold a grudge. He failed me once, I'm not going to have anything to do with him anymore. No, 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 forget it. He's, he's out of my book. He's in the, he's in, you know, no, no, Paul was too big for that. And uh, he saw the progress, the progress that John Mark had, had done and, and that he became a, a, a worthy companion of ministry. And John Mark uh, is seen in the, in the last pages, in the last uh, uh, sections of Paul's um, life saying, bring me John Mark. You know, when I, when I look at the life of John Mark and then compare it with mine, I say, I think, you know, I, it's good that the Lord put this man's story in the Bible. How many of you have failed the Lord at, at any time in your life? And then somebody would point their finger and say, how did you do that? You miserable, blah, 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 you know, and so, you know, this, but then somebody came back and said, you know, I know we all fail. You know, when I think of John Mark, I remember when I was back in Toro Home Baptist Church. It's a church for the military. I was only about a few weeks in the Lord when the pastor, there was about 80 people in the congregation. At the end of every service, the pastor would ask somebody to pray and, and close the, the service in prayer. And, and you know, I, at that point in my life, I didn't, I didn't know how to speak in public. I, I didn't even know how to speak in front of three people. And you know what the pastor did? He says, Brother Perez, would you please close the service in prayer? You know what happened to me? I went, and I wanted to hide under the chair. And I, and I looked around, everybody bowed their heads to pray. And I said, dear Heavenly Father, I, I just didn't know what to do. I, I put three or four words together and I froze. 
I held it, held it there for a few, for what seemed to me a million years, which was probably just a few seconds, and then closed and said, in Jesus' name, amen. I just wanted to run back out of the church. You know, don't want to go back to that church. But somebody at the end of the service came, put their arm around me and said, Brother Perez, you taught me a lesson today. I taught you a lesson? And he said, yeah, we well, need to learn how to pray better. And he gave me encouragement. He says, don't, don't, don't think anything of this. I know it's pretty hard, especially the first time. That brother, I don't remember his name, he's one of those individuals that you see in the Bible who appears and disappears, but has made the difference at one point. The person that kind of puts their arm around, your, around you and says, hey, I love you, brother. Don't give up. Yeah, you've failed, but who hasn't? Just keep it going. Get up and keep moving. We need these stories in the Bible. And then remember, I also spoke a little bit about Jesus or Justus, as we see here in uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 11. And, Je and Jesus, which is called Je Justus, or the just, who are of the circumcision, they Jews, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort to me. And these two, this individual has comforted me. Jesus, or Justus, was a Jewish believer who served with Paul, but we know absolutely nothing about him. He's one of those names at the end of the movie whose, whose name just appears, does something that seems irrelevant and just disappears. But Paul says, oh, his, 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 his work, his, his testimony to me was not irrelevant. It was so important. He comforted me. Imagine being Paul's comforter. Imagine inviting, imagine everybody here and I say, hey, brothers and sisters, we have a tremendous speaker today. I managed to get brother Paul, the apostle, to come and speak for us. How many of you say, whoa, Paul at a Royal Baptist Church? And he would sit there, kind of a beaten down man, and just sit there. And then I go and invite him, and he was just standing up here, very uh, humble, and would say, oh, my dear brothers, it was this individual that sat there in the, one, in the corner one day that the Lord used to get, bring me here today. It was that individual who held me up when I didn't have the strength to move on. And then mentions it was Justus. Who's this? Anybody know Justus? Yeah, the just one. Now, we don't know anything about this man. And Paul said, oh, I know a lot about him. He was there for me when I needed him. A Jewish believer. And uh, again, we see very little of him, but we do know what Paul said. He's a fellow worker and he's my comforter. One who encourages me, one who refreshes me. Who, one who revives my spirit when I'm down in the dumps. You know, this makes Paul very human, doesn't it? When we think about this, we think that, you know, Paul is this great apostle, this uh, trailblazer who just plows into the mission field and starts churches everywhere. He doesn't need anybody, and he's just that kind of person who will always stand. But if you look at these individuals, you'll see that Paul said, no, 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 <laughs> you got it all wrong. I am the captain of sinners. I persecuted the church. I am very sick most of the time. I prayed to God to remove that sickness, that illness. We don't know what that was. But God said, no, you're going to have to keep it. And in return, he put these men by my side to hold me up when I didn't have the strength. Praise God for those individuals who comforted me. We don't think that way when we look at the life of Paul. But if Paul was here, he would take time to mention these names. And how about Luke, the physician? In chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Luke, the beloved, underline that word. He's a loved one. He's a, one of those that have always, he's, a, he's, a, he's a, a Gentile. But Paul says, oh, you know, God called me to be an apostle. I had the power to heal. Oh, Paul, well, if you have the power to heal, why well, take a physician with you? Luke was very important, a very important man in the early church. 
as I said before, he was a Gentile. And yet he was chosen by God to write the Gospel of Luke and the history of the early church, the book of Acts. He is probably the only Gentile writer of the book in of the Bible, uh, of any book in the Bible. He was a physician, and as Paul says, he was a dearly beloved individual. He's very, he's been very, very close with Paul. I imagine although, although Paul, you know, had the power to heal, he said, you know, uh, there are times where I need a physician. That's a good balance. Some people have, have heard say, well, I don't need doctors. I trust the Lord will heal me from this illness. Well, what if he doesn't? Maybe you want to go to the doctor. Paul did. Paul had carried one with him. I remember J.T. Lange. You've heard me mention this name very several times. He was one of, my, one of my mentors back in Madrid. In my early years, I needed a mentor. Somebody who would be big enough, tall enough, strong enough, and who would be red and, and kind enough, merciful enough to get by me, by my side, and say, Sammy, um, it, 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 it's, it, it was never easy. It's not easy now. It will never be easy. But, you know, I found, I found comfort in the Lord. The Lord just knows how to put people in my way. And he would tell me stories about when he was in Liberia, Africa, going from one tribe to another. He would have different interpreters. He would go maybe to uh, 10 tribes, each one uh, speaking a different dialect or a different tribal language, needing a, <clears throat> a translator or, or interpreter. But in many occasions, he said, we would carry a doctor. We would have, carry missionary doctors. So why didn't you trust the Lord to take care of you? He said, sure, yeah, we did. But uh, there were times where we needed uh, special attention. We had our doctors with us. And there were men who used that profession to serve other men who were in the ministry. A physician that Paul calls dearly beloved. Luke joined Paul and his, and his party to Charles. In Acts chapter 16, verse 10, it says, And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And we see that Paul, I mean, Luke was one of the companions, a team of four. He had called us. We're, we're, with, we're part of this team. God has called Paul, yes, the mission was only to Paul, but Paul, the, the rest of the team said, hey, we're in this together. Remember the title of this message? Anybody remember? We are all in this together. No doubt Luke's professional experience and his professional skills were a great encouragement to Paul during the very difficult times. While God can and does bring strength and healing in miraculous ways, he also uses means provided in nature, such as medication. I remember a brother called Joaquin Marin. He was the pastor in, in one of the churches in Madrid. We became very good friends of his. Uh, before he, uh, he was made pastor, he, he, ex he exercised um, his uh, skills in, as a doctor, a medical doctor. He was a medical doctor, but then later on he was called to be, take over the pastorship. Uh, uh, I remember uh, at one time when we were traveling through different parts of Spain, Europe, and getting ready to travel to the States to raise support, that he, that, you know, he, we met together for lunch and, and he looked at Maritza, she was, she had, she was probably less than 50 kilos in weight. She was very sick. She had pancreatitis metabolica in Spanish. I don't know how you say that in English, but a problem with her pancreas. And uh, she was losing weight very fast. And uh, of course, our traveling was becoming very heavy on her. Remember, imagine living out of a suitcase for a year and a half in Europe. And then the same thing in the States, having no permanent residence. One week you're here, the next week you're somewhere else. You're meeting people, different people all the time. You don't know what's going to happen. You go out there by faith trying to make the best uh, the, the, uh, that you can, bringing out your report, giving the message, trying to bring people into the ministry so that they can participate with you, at, you know, uh, uh, so that we can go to Spain. <clears throat> and here's Joaquin saying, Sammy, I know you went out by faith. And the Lord has done many wonderful things in you, in your life. 
And I'm, I'm sure he wants to do many more, but you need to take Maritza out of this environment or you'll lose her. That's what he said. He scared me. And I looked at Marissa and said, you know, ministry is important, but my wife is also important. But it was him that the Lord used to warn us about a danger that we had ahead. And we took advice. And we got away for some time, but it's so recovered, then we were able to continue with our trips. But it was this great brother, Joaquin Marin, who the Lord used, and his experience in medics, in, in, in pharmacy, they said, hey, Brother Sammy, uh, you, you, you went out trusting the Lord, you went out understanding that he is able to uh, help you through even every situation, but you need to take note of what's going on. It was Luke who stayed with Paul all the way to the end of his life in 2 Timothy. That, remember, 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul writes. And uh, he knew something that probably no other human being is allowed to know. He knew that the end was uh, about to come. He knew that God was going to take him soon. And he writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 11, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. It's the end. I'm going. You would wonder, okay, Paul, all those years of ministry, all those people that have been with you, all those people that hung with you and held you up, how many of them are still with you? How many stayed all the way to the end? You know the one that stayed all the way to the end? Luke. We find in this chapter, 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 11, it says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous the judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them who also that love his appearing, uh, his appearing, all those who love his appearing, do thy diligence to come surely unto me. For Demas, oh boy, what happened to Demas? Hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Consist to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, and then in verse 2, it says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me. Wow. Luke, all the way to the end. He probably saw Paul die. And he probably shared a tear. My friend, my beloved friend, who has taught me so much whose work I admire tremendously. Paul is no, not here with me anymore. What am I going to do? I've been with him so, for so many years. He says, I'm holding him up. But he's been the one holding me up all this time. Only Luke is with me, Paul says. At the end of his life, Paul looked around. You know, it's hard to go being alone. And Paul was probably at that situation. Names, hundreds of people in his letters. But now he only has one name to mention. My beloved physician. Luke is a glowing example of the professional man who uses his skills in the service of the Lord and gives himself to go wherever God sends him. He was a beloved Christian, a skillful physician, a devoted friend, and a careful historian, all wrapped up in one. These are the men who stayed. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, Marcus, Jesus also, people know him by, the Romans know him by Justus. He's a fellow worker. 
He's a hard worker. And Luke, Luke always there, always ready to help. These were all men who injected their service into the life and ministry of Paul and together glorified the Lord tremendously. But then you have the silent workers. Let me finish with that tonight. There are people that Paul mentioned that helped him, but he doesn't mention their name. When we think about Paul's work in all the churches that he established all over along the Mediterranean coast, you think, wow, what a tremendous missionary. But listen now, listen carefully. Who stayed with the work? Who were left with the work? You know, I remember years ago when we went back to the States to give a report to the supporting churches, one church in particular, it was Pacific, um, Seaview Baptist Church in a city called Pacifica, which is about one hour south of San Francisco. Beautiful city. This church was welcoming us. They invited us to come and make, present the ministry. Now, I'll give you a report. And you know what they had right in, it's a big church building, and they had right in front a banner. Welcome the Paresis, welcome from Spain. And we felt like and all they needed was a band, you know, to round the whole thing up. We were like, wow. And every, when we walked into the church, people just came and gathered. We were, we were looked at as heroes. It was very uncomfortable for me. You know, I've never gone through anything like that. But these people thought of us as, you know, they went and they come back and they have good tidings, have good information, they have good news. We've invested in these missionaries. They kind of looked at us as heroes, although we didn't see ourselves as that. But when I thought later on, when I went home and I said, have they ever thought of the people back at home who are sticking with it, carrying on with the church? They don't know those people. When we showed the slides, when we showed the, the video presentation, I, I took note. I said, you know this one here? This, this is so-and-so. He's been there since the beginning. We've gone through very difficult times together. We even knocked heads sometimes. But they love the Lord, and we stuck together. They've been there from the beginning. Oh, you know this individual here? He just, he just came in. This is a new convert. And I was giving these names. Sometimes, you know how I am with names. I was, there were faces on the screen that was giving different names. But he just said, Dad never gets it right. And he would say, it's good that they don't really know the real names of those people you mentioned. I knew those people very well, but, but you know, my names got confused. But you know what I'm trying to say is this. How about all the people that stayed behind taking care of the work that Paul established? They're not mentioned, but they were there year after year after year after year, all until the end. Maybe somebody else came on, took over the church. Their names are not mentioned. Aren't you glad that God takes note? Although people might not receive you with banners, I didn't deserve that banner, but you know, we might not be received with that way, that people might not even know our name. But in, in, after 10 years when I'm, when I'm dead, people will probably wonder who, you know, and how was this church established? I don't care, really, as long as people get, uh, God receives the glory. Listen, it's, remember how I closed the message last week with 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says, hey, just make sure that you are busy building. That you are busy doing something for the Lord. You're not going to get credit for my work. I'm not going to get credit for your work. Each one will get credit for their own work or for their own lack of work. So as we see these names here, don't just close the epistle and say, okay, let's go to the next one. Let's go now to 1 Thessalonians. It's more interesting stuff there. These names are important. Next week, or maybe next time, not next week, I'll be in Germany next week. Next time we're going to see somebody who was behind the curtain, behind the scenario, fervently praying for different individuals. We'll be looking at the man who prayed. As the Bible says, always laboring fervently for you in prayer. Laboring in prayer. Have you ever thought of prayer as a labor? 
as a ministry? The man who prayed. I said I would close with that last example, but I have one more, if you allow me. I think I've shared this with some of you. But this stuck very, very deep in my mind years ago when I was still going to Toro Home Baptist Church. That church, being a military church, had people coming, evangelists coming maybe four or five times a year. You would get missionaries or pastors or evangelists from all over the states that would come and preach, and boy, their messages were so reviving. And there was this time when one man came, very white hair, kind of around his 70s, tremendous preacher, good, good speaker. And uh, boy, he was, you know, this guy was just, wow. And uh, he shared his testimony. He says, years ago, I was invited to pastor a, a church in so, such and such a city. The church wasn't really that big. I decided to take it over. And then I started, you know, working that church. And month after month, year after year, we saw how the church grew. It grew. It outgrew the building. We had to get a new building. The church kept on growing. And, of course, very soon I was being called Dr. So-and-so. I wasn't a doctor. He didn't have a doctor's degree in theology. But he's being called doctor because of the size of his church. And he was going around like saying, yeah, I'm the big guy. He said the story at the end of this message that really spoke to my heart. He said, one evening, when I was going back home after a visit to one of the members, it was late at night, I passed by the church and there was one of the lights was on. And I thought, oh, the caretaker probably forgot to turn the lights off. So he stopped at the parking lot. He went into the church very quietly. He saw that the, the, the altar area was lit up. And he thought, maybe we have a burglar here or something. And so he was very careful to kind of look in through the door and look in front where the pulpit was. And he saw one of the members who nobody ever paid attention to because he was in a wheelchair. The kind of guy that kind of just rolls in, stands back, and uh, nobody pays attention to because he's not pleasant to look at. He said, I don't remember ever coming to him and greeting him, but I saw him laying on his, on his face in front of the pulpit, praying, almost crying out fervently like this man Epaphras. Say, Lord, please bless my preacher. Bless our pastor. Give him the power of the Holy Spirit. May you work through him to give you glory. And he was on this praying for his pastor with such urgent, you know, such fervency that he, he got, you know, he was gripped by this prayer. He didn't even go in to talk to this man. He just went back home trembling, got back on his car, rode on his car back home saying, Lord, please forgive me for thinking it was just me that brought success to this church. It was that individual who nobody paid attention to. The one that was bringing me before the throne of grace. The epaphras in his church was this man that nobody paid attention to. He said, I learned a lesson that day. I got back on the pulpit the next Sunday. And when that man came in rolling in his wheelchair, he came to him, didn't make him a big, you know, big entrance, but he just said, Hey, brother, I want to thank you for being here because you have encouraged me. You have refreshed me. You are lifting me up before the Lord, and I'm a better man when I get up on the pulpit because of you. Nobody around that man understood what this pastor was saying. Probably the individual in the wheelchair didn't understand. But the pastor understood. Let's never forget those who fervently pray, who are, as we see here, always laboring fervently for you in prayer, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he had a great seal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Heliopolis. 
Thank you, Epaphras, for your tremendous testimony. Let's all stand. We'll get into that next time. The man who prayed. And uh, we will see also Demas at the end of the letter. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for these men. Thank you, Lord, for registering those names in our Bibles. Help us, Lord, when we read the Bible again, never to just run through these names and not pay any attention. For Paul, these were great men that held him up. For us, they are great examples that we should follow. For you, Lord, there were men who honored you, whether their names were up on a banner or not. These men stayed. These men prayed. These men held on to the baton, to the flag, Lord, to the banner, all the way to the end. Let us learn from these examples. Let us be, uh, make us to be uh, individuals who will hold uh, strong all the way to the end, no matter what happens. Help us learn from these individuals. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.